Hello again and welcome. Today we're going to start transient testing the Keysight U1282A. But before we do that, what I'd like to do is just take this meter apart. This will be the first time it's been apart actually. Of course a few people have reviewed this meter. It's quite old. Again, this one was made in 2001, I believe. So it may have some minor differences. You can see the battery cable right up in the corner here. So if you're going to take one of these apart, just don't go pulling on the back of the case. Soldering looks good. Fairly good size shunt. You can see the meter is using the larger body PTCs. And here's our two surge rated resistors. Normally I'd expect these PTCs to be about 1.3K or so. You can see in circuit it measures about 790 ohms. The surge rated resistors are also typically about a 1K ohm. And here we can see in circuit they're measuring about 250. Let's just check our other side. So yeah, about 270 ohms on that side. I am kind of curious what they're using for the detent spring. So let's just go ahead and we'll finish taking this apart. Here we can see the contacts. Notice there's a lot of spacing there. You can see to pop these out, we just push the spring forward. Like so. We can just pull this off to the side. Looks like this is a number eight. Looks like the center screw stays in place. Probably holds the lens over the LCD. So, so far I'd say we pull him, him, him and him. I think the last one is to disengage these two springs. And again, we can just pull these away like so. There we go. Okay, up here, you can see our small gas discharge tubes. Doesn't look like these changed at all. They're still a 2 kV part. From what I remember, that's what was shown in Dave's review of the meter. All in all, the design looks good. You can see they have a lot of high voltage slots in here. Switch contacts themselves look pretty good. I believe this is the same design that was used in the first key sight meter we looked at. Let's just go ahead and we'll lift out our detent spring. We just put a little bit of tension on these. They're pretty stiff. I think we're just going to have to run it and see how it does. Notice a little bit of shielding for the front of the meter. There's also some towards the back. You can tell this has some kind of a water type seal. This is what's causing this thing to be so stiff. Right here is our O-ring. I'm sure that this is what's causing the majority of the drag. You can see though they've added a lot of grease in this area. You can see the back side of the switch is just saturated. Rather not disturb this as much as possible. You can see how this kind of fits together. You got a couple of tangs here. They captivate this plastic piece. Kind of locks it in place. And then the two screws for the circuit board go into these two bosses. And I believe when I made a model of the front end of this meter, I just assumed all the standard values. I'd have to go back and look at that video again. 
but this could end up behaving quite a bit different than what the model did. So again, looking at Dave's video, we know that the part is marked 201411. If we look at the layout of the circuit board, there's the common input terminal that ties to two PTCs through a high voltage resistor and into the gas discharge tube and then return back through the ground path. These two circuits are in parallel, not in series. So what I'd like to do is build up a small test circuit. I'll be using a 1K 2 watt resistor. This will be made by TE. This resistor is flame proof and it's pulse withstanding. This resistor is designed to handle a high energy pulse. For the PTC, I'm going to be using a 1K device as well. This is a 6.5 millimeter disc. It's a part number YKD100N1000. This device is rated for 265 volts and it's rated to carry a maximum of 30 milliamps. For the gas discharge tube, I'm going to be using a little fuse part. This part is a CG32.0L. If we supply a 100 volt per microsecond pulse, the part will break down at 2500 volts. At 1 kV per microsecond, it'll break down at 2750. With DC, its breakdown voltage is between 1600 and 2400 volts. This part has a capacitance of less than 1.5 picofarads. That's one of the benefits of using a gas discharge tube, is they have very low capacitance. One of the downsides is they also switch very slow. And of course we've looked at meters in the past like the Hioki, as well as that Gossam Metrowatt that uses gas discharge tubes. I think if it's designed right, this is an acceptable approach. Both of those meters proved to be very robust. The problem with using a gas discharge tube is of course they're a little bit slower than a MAV, but they have the advantage of once they arc over, the voltage is going to be dropped to zero volts. So that's going to put all the strain on the PTC and the surge rated resistor. And of course with these having lower values, that's going to place even more stress on them. I don't know, it'll be interesting to see how this holds up. You'll notice that the nuts have a rounded side and then a flat side. So the flat side goes down. Again, we just hoop the little springs back over the top of the notch. Pull these back into place. Like so. And you can see this top wafer is keyed. Notice the three nubs towards the bottom. Notice the lack of them here. So this is only going to go on one way. Right there. Let me just plug in our power cable. Again, they gave you basically no lead there, so be careful if you take yours apart. Should just fire up, no problem. Again, for the battery cover, you just want to push these little seals down inside the holes like so. And I think before I do anything else with this, I'm just going to go through a quick functional test. And I'll just do that off camera. So a viewer had asked about using this meter to look at some lower value capacitors. What I have here is just a banana to a BNC connector. And then a BNC to an SMA. We'll just attach this to the front of the meter like so. You can select the capacitance mode. And you can see it reads about 5 picofarads. If I remove the adapter, looks like it drops to maybe one picofarad, maybe zero. <laughs> All right, so this assembly is roughly five picofarads. What we're going to do is look at some of the capacitors that I made up for testing the nano VNA. Here I have a 22 picofarad. This is one from American Technical Ceramics. This is a 39 picofarad. And it's in series with a 1 ohm, 1% 1 resistor. Here we have a 220 picofarad. And then I have an array of 330 picofarad. These are a 5% part. And these are also from American Technical Ceramics. Of course, these circuit boards are going to have a certain amount of capacitance as well. We have to compensate for that. And the way we're going to do that is by attaching this open. Let's go ahead and do that. 
and again we're expecting the capacitance to go up slightly and you can see it gets up to roughly seven picofarads now we'll go ahead and null out the meter and you can see it's reading zero picofarads alright so let's start with our 22 picofarad Again, the meter is pretty slow, but you can see it settled in to 22 picofarads right on the nose. Again, this is our 39 picofarad from ATC, and again, this is in series with a 1 ohm resistor. And we have to wait for the meter to settle. You can see it's reading 39 picofarad right on the money. Again, this is a 220 picofarad. And again, we can see the meter reads 220 right on the money. And again, this is our 330 picofarad. And this is a 5% part. And it looks like it comes in at 343 picofarads. So I'm just going to select the hold. And let's try the same measurement using a different meter. We'll be using the Fluke 187. And again, we'll use our open standard to null this out. See roughly 74 picofarads. And again, we'll use the same capacitor. You can see 342 versus 343. So there's one picofarad difference between these two meters as long as we use the same fixture, same capacitor, same techniques. A viewer was asking about the impedance of the key sight meter when you're using the different current modes. Essentially what they're asking about is what the burden voltage for this meter is. So we're going to compare this against a few other meters. Normally I won't use the current input for handheld meter. I'll end up using a shunt. You can see I have different ones. These are all made by Weston. Slower one is 100 amp. This is 150, here's a 50 amp, here's a 500 amp. Of course then I'll use my bench meter or I'll have to amplify the signal coming off of this. Like a few of you, I'm sure that you've cobbled up different shunts for your meters as well. I ended up making this one because I've done it so many times, I put this thing into a box. But essentially that's all this is, is a powered shunt. It's got a chopper stabilized amplifier in it and then it has an output that can attach to your oscilloscope. I have a video online if you're interested in how this thing works. So on my far right you can see I have my Gossin MetraHit Ultra. Of course the Keysight U1282, the Bryman BM869S. Notice that there's two of them. Then we have the 789, the Fluke 187, the Sem DT9939, and then my UT61E. So all these meters are currently in series, except for this Bryman in the center. We're going to be using this one to measure the burden voltage. All the meters are in their microamp ranges. So again, you can see we're applying almost 550 milliamps right now. We'll start with our Gossin, and you can see we're reading 28.29 millivolts. Keysight is reading 
3.7 millivolts. I would expect the Brahmins a little higher. Yep, 55.88 millivolts. And the 789, I would think, is going to be very similar. So, yep, 56.25. Let's have a look at our Fluke 187, and it's 55.33. Now, the SEM meter, the reason I chose this is typically these low end meters like this will have a very high burden voltage. And you can see 276. Of course, the Unity on the left originally had a very high burn voltage as well. And I've made a whole series where I've modified this particular meter. And one of the changes was to add a chopper stabilized amplifier and a lower shunt. So let's have a look. There you go. So roughly 6 millivolts on this meter by far lower than any other one that we've got here. So now knowing the voltage and the current you can calculate what this low shunt is. I've changed all of our meters over to the milliamp functions. Of course I've increased our current to about 107.6 milliamps. Again all the meters reading basically the same. And let's start with the UT61E and we're getting about 509 millivolts. Versus 983 or so for the SEM. Looks like about 186 for our Fluke 87. 263 for the 789. 188 I'd say for the BM869S. Our key site's about 192. And it looks like about 65 for our Gauss and Metrowatt. So for an unmodified meter in this range, the Gossen by far exceeds any of the other meters. You can see I've restrapped each meter to their high current jacks. I'm also putting out now about 4 amps. And you can see all the meters are reading roughly 4 amps. Again, we'll just start with the unity meter. And it looks like we're reading about 108 millivolts. The SEM is about 100. 73 millivolts. Our Fluke 187 is about 120 millivolts. Our BM 789 is about 94 millivolts. The BM 869 is about 230 millivolts. Let's see our key site, about 133. And the Gauss and Ultra, about 167. So it looks like for the higher current ranges, this BM789 has the lowest burden voltage. One of the tests that I normally perform is I'll take the meters up to whatever their rate of voltage is. Of course all these meters are rated for 1000 volts. Somebody was talking to me about how I was damaging the MOVs when I was testing these meters. So one of the things I did was I took this exact meter and I took it above the 1000 volts and I left it there for days I think it was. And I was measuring the current as well as the voltage. We were logging that. And I was basically looking for an increase in the current during that test to see if we were seeing any kind of a change in the leakage current, which may be an indication that the MOVs were starting to fail. We never saw anything like that. And I ended up taking this meter all the way up to 1500 volts and I left it there. I think in that case, what it was is the person that I was talking with thought for some reason that the MOVs were directly across the inputs of the meter. Of course, that's not the case. They're sitting typically behind a surge rated resistor, which is normally going to be a 1K ohm, and that's in series again with typically a 1.3K ohm PTC. So by the time it gets to the MOVs, you've got a lot of resistance there to limit the current through them. Even if we reach the point where the MOVs start to break down, which is going to be about 1600 volts, with the current being so limited, I wouldn't think that we'd see any kind of damage to the meters. As a matter of fact, all the meters that I've damaged to date, none of those have been a result of the MOVs failing. Of course, we have seen the PTCs come apart. We've certainly seen a lot of the high-speed clamps blow apart, and in some cases where they don't have adequate input protection, of course, we lose the controller ICs. So because the key site is using gas discharge tubes 
and we know that those don't arc over till about 2000 volts in this case and we also know now that they're using a much lower resistance PTC as well as the resistor so the total series resistance for this meter is going to be closer to about 500 ohms I think it was so what I'd like to do is go ahead and increase the voltage and let's just take it up and see if this thing basically limits where it stops displaying the voltage or can we get it up to basically what we've ran this fluke up to I don't remember ever running this BM869S up to above a thousand volts but let's just have a look and see how this behaves as well see all three meters are tracking very nicely they're all basically displaying 843 volts Here we're at a thousand volts. Again, that's what the Keysight meter is rated for. Let's go ahead and take it on up higher. You can see this is the limit of what the fluke meter is capable of reading. Again, I've had this meter up higher than this. Right there, you can see the Keysight meter is overranging. I'm just going to slowly adjust it down right there. So basically at 1500 volts it overranges. Let's just let the meter sit here for a while. Again, I'm not expecting this to cause any problems with any of these meters, but it doesn't hurt to look. Right, we've had it up there for a few minutes now. Go ahead and adjust this back down. Yeah, it looks fine. So here we're looking at the IEC 61010, section 101.3.2, protection by certified overcurrent protection device. And the part that we're interested in is right here. If the protection device is a fuse, it's replaced with an open circuited fuse. A voltage of two times the highest rated voltage for any terminal is applied to the terminals of the overcurrent protected measuring circuit for one minute. The source of the test voltage shall be capable of delivering 500 VA during and after the test. No damage to the equipment shall occur. So, this key sight meter is rated for 1000 volts on the input jacks. What we would like to do is apply 2kV to each of the current inputs. Now, I've gone ahead and removed both fuses. I'm not going to replace these with an open circuited fuse. Having that fuse in there could actually eat up some of the clearances. So it could actually make matters worse. So what I'm going to do is use our little ESD gun. Again, the power supply in this can go up to about 5,000 volts. It's not a lot of current. All I'm looking for is for the meter to break down. So we're going to start with the microamp setting. And we're just going to turn this up to 2,000 volts. Oh, it's interesting. You can see it's drawing enough current that it's actually causing this power supply to fold back. Let's just try it in the amps position. Same effect at about a thousand volts. Hmm. All right, so to get around this little problem, we'll be using our applied kilovolts power supply. Again, it's not rated anywhere near 500 VA, but hopefully it supplies enough current to overcome whatever's going on with this meter here. On the front here, we have our 10x attenuator. This is something that I custom built. There is a video online that goes over the design for this. Again, this is just attached in series between the power supply and this BM869S. Right now it's basically reading nothing. We'll turn up the power supply a little bit. 
So right now, this being a 10x attenuator, we're putting currently about 277 volts out of the power supply. So let's just go ahead and we'll turn that back down. We'll be going between the common and we'll just start with the 10 amp input. And we'll just attach this to the power supply's output. All right, and let's go ahead and turn this thing up. So there's a thousand volts, fifteen hundred. Oh, fifteen hundred. Oh, right there. So something in this meter is causing enough of a load where I can't even reach the 2,000 volts. <laughs> so I have a larger power supply, but it's only rated 4,000 volts. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to run this test. The best I can do is crank this thing up to where the power supply just starts to fold back, and we'll just let it sit here for a minute. It does make me wonder, though, what would happen if we actually had the ability to run the test? Alright, there's basically a minute. Turn the power supply back down. And we'll go to our microamp jack. And again, we'll start taking the voltage back up. Let's see if it clips at about the same level. Looks like it does. And again, we'll let it sit for roughly a minute. Okay, I'm just kind of curious if I change the polarity of this, does that have anything to do with this threshold where it's starting to clip? What does? Nope, I still can't get any higher. Again, the standard's pretty clear. Voltage of two times the highest rated, so we definitely want to be running this at 2,000 volts. Like I say, I just don't have a power supply that's beefy enough to do it with this particular meter. We've done it before in the past. I've not ever ran into a problem with it before. But there's something unique with this design that they're clamping that. But it does make me wonder if we actually had a 500 VA source, would those current inputs be damaged from it? Yeah, I don't know. Interesting. I would say inconclusive, but something to be aware of. So before giving up on this, I did try one other test. Of course, this attenuator presents somewhat of a load as well. So what I did is I used the Bryman to measure the voltage of the output of the power supply, and then I removed the attenuator and the Bryman from the equation, and then plugged the power supply directly into the key sight meter without that additional load. And again, you could hear the power supply folding back. So even without this load added, it's not capable of driving the input of this meter. Again, this power supply, though, is no slouch. This is a model HW 2.5, again, 2.5 kilovolts. Just interesting. Again, never ran into a problem like this before. Somebody's got a bigger power supply in one of these meters, and you're willing to run this test, I'd be interested to know what your results are. I ran the Keysight meter through a full functional test, and it doesn't appear that we've damaged it. So the next thing I'd like to do is run our full wave rectified signal into the meter. And the way that we do that is we use our transient generator. Again, this transient generator can put out a 220 volt AC signal that's been fully rectified. Looks like it still powers up just fine. You'll notice that the meter is too tall to fit into our little test box here. People complain about the BM869S being a large meter. I mean, there's your difference. <laughs> so again, what we're going to do 
is attach the transient generator to the inputs of the meter and we'll just set this to AC volts and let's go ahead and we'll turn on the output and you can see this is showing a 115 volts that's typical and if we go to DC voltage you're gonna see this is 220 volts or so let's see 230 so again the idea is that we rotate this through each function Of course, we don't do anything with the current inputs. And that's it. I'll go ahead and functional test the meter and let's see if we caused any problems. So it looks like our meter is still okay after that test. So one of the things I'd like to mention is that somebody posted up on the EV blog somehow confusing this box with some kind of a calibrator. The way I took it is they basically felt that this box was being used to somehow prove the calibration of the meter or essentially proving that the meter meets its accuracy specs. I doubt that there's too many of you viewers that are going to somehow assume that this little $300 or so box is going to be able to replace what a fluke calibrator does at you know fifty dollars to $100,000. It's just not the case. Again, this box is basically just used to prove that the meter is still functional. So for example, let's say we measure a 1K ohm and it starts out at 1.0 for example and the next time I go to measure it it's measuring 1.5 probably something's gone on with the meter and so then I'll spend more time looking into it but that's really all we're using this for it's just to get an idea of the functionality of the meter and we check that between each one of these tests to get an idea at what point the meter has actually been damaged next I'd like to perform the first part of our ESD testing again we're just going to use this gas grill igniter be curious about the waveforms that this puts out watch part two of my unity ut 181a review during that video i compared the waveform off of this using a high speed oscilloscope and a target against what the iec standard calls for so actually the transient off of this is quite weak again we'll be doing five transients with each function And again, we don't do anything with the current inputs. And just for a quick check, we'll just place this back into the resistance mode. Hopefully it goes open, which it does. That's a good sign. Let's just have a quick look. For example, our 1 mega ohm resistor, again, this is a 1% part. And it looks like the meter's reading spot on. That's a good sign. Diode check mode. It looks like it's an open. That's a good sign. Let's just go to capacitance real quick. This will be a 150 picofarad. Very good. Again, we're not zeroing out the meter. And let's just go to millivolts. And again, this should be somewhere around here, be about 20 millivolts. Looks good enough. All right, I'll go through a complete test, but I'm pretty sure just based on this, we didn't damage the meter. All right, so it looks like our key site survived our little piezo grill starter, or piezo as I would like to call it. So again, the transient off of this is quite weak. The CSD gun comes a lot closer to meeting the IEC standards. Again, if you're interested in the waveform coming off of this, that information is available online. Again, there's no way to switch the polarity on this, so we'll be doing that with the leads. Again, we'll be applying five transients, both positive and negative. I've never damaged a meter with this transient generator except one of the free harbor freight meters. Normally what ends up happening is if ESD is going to take them out, that little piezo grill starter takes them out. 
actually when I first started testing with that piezo grill starter I had said that I was surprised that that thing would damage any meter and so as I started testing some of those meters we discovered that we could indeed damage them and this should be roughly 500 degrees Celsius actually let's just check the millivolt while we're at it so again this should be about 20 and quick dial check mode that looks fine let's just put a 1 meg on here that looks fine as well and I'll go through a complete check of this but it looks like it survived that ESD test as well I just finished up editing the footage that we've collected so far for this video looks like we're already up to about 35 minutes I think we're gonna cut her short so for the next video we'll begin doing our search testing again this generator puts out a peak voltage of about 5.8 kV it's capable of about 20 joules it has a 2 ohm source impedance the open circuit voltage waveform on this was based on the IEC standards the full width half height on this is 100 microseconds versus 50 microseconds. Again, the current waveform is going to be completely different. This is not a combo generator. I'm not testing for safety. I'm really only interested in how electrically robust the meters are compared with one another. On top of this, we have a half cycle generator. Again, this can put out about 600 joules. Again, the waveform off of this is a very low voltage source. Typically what you could do is connect this directly to a meter and it's not going to have any effect. The only time we'll ever use this is if a meter breaks down. What we can do then is use this transient generator to basically cause an arc inside of the meter and then we'll feed that arc with this low voltage high energy source and then we can actually get some idea how the meter would handle a higher energy transient. Again nowhere near what the IEC standard calls out and again that was never my intent to prove that these meet those safety standards or not well, I think that's gonna be it for now hopefully you enjoyed the video in the next part again transient testing with this generator maybe with the other one and hopefully after that we can begin our switch cycle testing if there are any other non-destructive tests that you'd like to see again the meter is fully functional right now so feel free to write those into the comments or in that we'll see you on the next video later